Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next talk will be about the question on how molecular complexity can increase in a system which does not know any identical reproduction. So that's the core question. Here's a depiction of that one. We start at very early times with small molecules. At the end, we will have life. And in between, over the time axis, we have an increase, we have a huge, huge increase of complexity. We know that Darwinian evolution can go, do a very good job in that one, but this can only start at a point where we have uh, a system which can self-reproduce. But what about before that period? What about this stretch here? What's happening there? Well, whatever it is, it has to obey one very important principle, that's constant non-equilibrium. We definitely need a constant, long, uh, long constant non-equilibrium, since otherwise, we will have a situation where the system runs into equilibrium at a very short time, forms a crystal, maybe by dissipation of energy, but then this will stop. In order to keep this a long-going process, we need to do something that keeps it in the non-equilibrium state. And from, to my opinion, the most, uh, the most efficient way to do that is to change reaction conditions in an alternating way. For example, by switching some sort of a reaction condition, switching some parameter, which keeps the system uh, following a moving target. So the system will start to run into a liquid, then the parameter will change, and then it will have to start anew, and so on. So how can, the question now is how could this be done on early Earth? Which parameter would change periodically on early Earth? And of course the first a uh, thing that comes to mind is the day-night cycle, for example, change in the uh, dryness and wetness condition. And this leads to dry-wet cycling. Dry-wet cycling, we change the uh, chemical potential of water. And this change in chemical potential of water will induce such a situation on uh, a long ongoing process. This was well described in two papers, which I want to cite here by Paul Higgs and David Ross and David Diemer. But there are also other situations that we need to take into account. For example, there are cyclic processes which affect the pressure. For example, if you look at tidal phenomena or if we look at periodic uh, geological processes like geysers. And if this happens, then there are situations, there are positions, for example, in the Earth crust, one kilometer in depth, where we can induce phase transitions. For example, the phase transition from uh, gases, carbon dioxide, to supercritical carbon dioxide. And if we have that, we can switch between two states of carbon dioxide that were very different in their solvent quality. So we start switching a very good solvent into a very bad solvent. And this has interesting consequences. For example, we can run a cycle of condensation and hydrolysis. When the uh, carbon dioxide is supercritical, it takes up a lot of water. Due to that, the condensation step will be facilitated, water will be taken away from the chain molecule, and we can polymerize amino acids, for example. On the other hand, when the carbon dioxide becomes subcritical again, the water is coming back and the molecule will hydrolyze, and it will be uh, turned down into uh, amino acids again. So every switch in pressure will induce one cycle of condensation and hydrolysis. But this cycle can do more. For example, it can start a generation of vesicles. If we look at the carbon dioxide in a supercritical state, it's a good solvent. So it will saturate with water, it will take up organic molecules, and it will take up amphiphilic molecules. When the carbon dioxide turns subcritical again, the water will condensate in small droplets. The uh, surfactant, the, the amphiphilic molecules, will cover the surface and the organic molecules will be inside. And when these droplets settle onto the surface, then there will be an interaction between the amphiphilic layer on the droplet surface and the amphiphilic layer down here. And this will lead to the formation of vesicles. That's how they look like in the experiment here. And of course, these vesicles will disintegrate after time, especially when the carbon dioxide becomes supercritical again. Then we follow another cycle here. So every change in pressure will induce one generation of vesicles. So now we have a pool of peptides and we have generations of vesicles. Of course, we will expect some interaction, not of the hydrophilic ones, not of the hydrophobic ones, but of those peptides which are amphiphilic. For those peptides, the vesicles will be something like a kinetic trap. These 
peptides will be able to integrate into the membrane. By integration, they will become protected against hydrolysis, so they will accumulate and they will uh, increase in numbers. I call this the parasitic step because in this position, we will have an advantage to the peptide, but no advantage to the vesicle. But when the peptides keep growing, and we have reached the step in the experiment too, when they are long enough, they, uh, they get the capability of stabilizing the vesicles. And if they do that, then we have a mutual advantage to the peptide as well as to the vesicle, and the vesicle will survive several generations. And at this point, there will be an even stronger selectional advantage for these peptides. And we also uh, have reached this step here, the functional step, where the peptides start to affect, for example, permeability. When the peptides are being formed, we have a strong concentration gradient. And this concentration gradient causes osmotic pressure, and this shortens the lifetime of the vesicles. So by opening these channels, many peptides are capable of doing that, we all give them a chance to equilibrate this concentration and to release this pressure. Okay, so take the whole thing together. We have a pool of peptides, which is basically like a box of Legos we are shaking and expecting random structures to form. So there's no specificity in that one. But there are also the vesicles. The vesicles pick out certain peptides and by being selected all the time for this with stability, they will get more stable vesicles. They will get a better um, selecting uh, specimen and they will also develop functions. So I think based on that, we can say that we have some sort of a molecular or structural evolution, which is based purely on accumulation and selection processes. Of course, we have tried to do that in an experiment. We have uh, now an experiment running which goes over three weeks, which means 1,500 generations of vesicles. And then we start collecting peptides. It's hundreds of peptides. I just picked out a few ones. But what's very common to these peptides is a positively charged lysine group in the head and more or less hydrophobic groups at the end, sorry. And uh, these peptides, of course, then are amphiphilic and will collect in the membrane. Uh, one of the early specimens that we got was this peptide. And this peptide, we checked for its, uh, we checked out what the reason was why this peptide was being selected. So we had this peptide uh, synthesized, a commercial synthesis, and added it to vesicles. And we found three effects. We found first that the size of the vesicles was uh, reduced by approximately 50%. We found that the uh, vesicle permeability was increased by 90%, and we found that the peptide increased the vesicle stability, thermal dynamic stability, by a factor of six. So the half-life time was increased by a factor of six. We believe that all these changes are mechanisms of survival. So survival strategies of the vesicle, so to speak. With the last one, it's obvious, since by increasing the thermal dynamic stability, they live longer. With the second one, this means that the vesicle becomes uh, capable of releasing osmotic pressure. And with the first one, we believe that the size effect means that smaller vesicles are more capable of surviving shear or uh, bubbling, for example. OK, so now we believe that we are at this stage here. Now the question is, what comes next? What will develop? Of course, there's an end point here. This cannot go on forever. At the point where the rate of selection is equal to the rate of degradation, then everything will stop. However, there is a potential for a situation like that. I told in the beginning that there is a concentration gradient. So this concentration gradient can be regarded as a source of free energy. It's like a loaded battery. So maybe let's assume that the molecules passing through these channels could induce something like a high energy conformation to the peptide. And this could be the starting point of something like a very primitive uh, uh, energy metabolism of some kind. So this is something we had for right now, and this is something which we want to follow in the experiment which are being done in the future. Okay, at this point I want to leave this as a summary, and I thank you for the attention. And mm -hmm. so if you didn't get any farther, wouldn't this already be a success? 
I guess, I mean, so what do we expect mm -hmm. when we say we're going to get life out of these tubes? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've okay. got so much already, uh -huh. right? I, I mean, so when we do experimentation mm -hmm. with microbes, yeah, yeah. typically we get maybe a 50% improvement or maybe a threefold improvement. Yeah. But you've already got a sixfold improvement. So I kind of wonder what your yeah. expectations are for the long run mm -hmm. because you've already gotten some things that work very well. That's right. I mean, I have to mention one thing. We need to run this experiment in a way where it's kind of reproducible. These specimens which I've shown right now and all these changes which I've shown right now are one-time experiments. So what we need to do is we need to repeat and repeat this experiment. We need to find which of these changes and which of these uh, progresses that we see here is really reproducible. So I agree with you. It would be already a success. But of course, we are curious what will happen. Right now, we run the experiment for three weeks. Uh, that means 1,500 generations of vesicles. We could extend this to three months and have four times as many generations. And of course, we still expect a growth. We can still see now the peptides growing to length between 10 and 14, something like that. And of course, by that, we would expect something more uh, sophisticated to develop. Right, that's exactly something we do at the moment too. We have, for example, changed the conditions, like taken away the, the vesicles after half of the experimental time. I will talk about that on Wednesday. I will get some, somewhat more into detail on the experiment itself. And we see some changes there. We have a hard time to interpret them, to be honest. We see changes regarding, we have a full list of, of peptides which we observe to develop, and we see that they are significant, but you cannot really interpret what that means. But you're right, some hidden information is in the collection of peptides which we obtained under these circumstances. So. We work with a long-chain fatty acid, so it's uh, octadecyl uh, uh, decanoic acid, sorry, octadecyl amine. It's the mixture of these two. That's the, the membrane material, so to speak. Yes. Uh, we have strong hints that there are reactions in between the amphiphiles and the amino acids. So far, we have just ignored them. But you're right, they are there. And they may take part in this game somehow. So there may be mixed products in between the amphiphiles and the amino acids. But we have not characterized them yet because we are still fighting the very complex analytical problem that we have to deal with with all these uh, peptides, thousands, hundreds of thousands of peptides which form uh, and, and which need to be sequenced, which need to be identified. So yeah, we have to do one step after the other. But you're right, this is happening. Uh, yeah, let's uh, thank Christian again and...